systems with uh, uh, with uh, spins with competing uh, interactions are quite fascinating system where many emergent uh, phenomena are present uh, like uh, some analogs of photons or even of magnetic uh, di uh, magnetic uh, monopoles so our speaker today has uh, been working in this field for a long time he has done a lot of uh, seminal contributions in the field in particular of uh, of pyrochlores that is extremely uh, rich uh, for for everyone so it's a pleasure to uh, welcome uh, welcome him he has a uh, uh, canada research chair he's a fellow of the american physical society of the royal society he's uh, been a faculty in uh, waterloo for a little while and he uh, helps us a lot with the demands of subvention when we search for someone who speaks French at the exterior of Quebec. It falls often on him. Uh, so, uh, ben, voilà. Alors, so uh, please welcome uh, Michel, uh, Michel Gingras. Okay. Uh, thank you, André-Marie. Uh, merci pour tout le monde. Uh, I'm quite, uh, quite happy and to give this uh, RQMP seminar across uh, three campuses, I guess. Um, so um, uh, without further ado, let me uh, get started. Uh, please, um, I don't know if I'm gonna, I have to monitor two screens. So, uh, so don't, uh, so if you have any questions, please jump in, uh, don't raise your hand, I will, I will not catch it. Okay, so, um, um, uh, so let me first, before I give well, you the- uh, the Michel? Yes. Uh, if people want to write in the chat, I, I mean, they can interrupt. Yes. But if they want to write in the chat, I will monitor it also. Okay. So. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, so before, before I get started with the, uh, the, the, the introduction per se and what the, the, the talk is about, let me, let me throw at you a, a few ideas which are, which are not really connected. And, uh, but, uh, and try to, to kind of tell you why I got interested in this problem and where I, I came from and how it got, it got started from my perspective. So, so, the, so many contexts to, uh, context to, to think about, let's think about surface phase transitions. So in condensed matter physics, there's many contexts or systems where there's some interesting surface phenomena, like in liquid crystals, you can have surface freezing, not only surface melting, but surface freezing. You have interesting scaling laws for the temperature dependence at, we, at which each layer proceeds to, uh, to freeze in, in these systems. Uh, people have studied, for example, how the glass transition in polymer films uh, proceeds as a function of uh, the, the, the thickness of the film and so on and so on and so on. So this is one, one story. Um, another story is that uh, for more uh, in, uh, directed towards hot condensed matter, is that there's been lots of uh, fascinating uh, experiments and observations over the years uh, regarding uh, ethereal structures where at interfaces of uh, various oxides, for example, uh, like strontium titanate and lanthanum titanate interfaces, uh, even strictly two-dimensional ones, um, you can observe superconductivity and ferromagnetism and um, um, occurring uh, right at the interfaces of two disparate materials. Uh, we know now that uh, uh, topological systems and uh, bulk surface correspondence can give rise to very interesting phenomena where, for example, you can have a, a bulk insulator uh, in topological insulators, but the, the surface is as uh, um, metallic states. Um, so this is another uh, thread. Uh, a third thread, thread is uh, in, uh, if we think about uh, uh, highly frustrated magnetic systems of which uh, Henri Marie was alluded, alluding to, um, these uh, systems have been studied extensively for the past 30 years, and there's many things that we know about them that are general qualitative features. They are extremely sensitive to perturbations, for example, uh, quantum and thermal fluctuations uh, that can give rise to order by disorder phenomena, spin liquid states. Um, we know that weak interactions beyond nearest neighbor or dipole interactions can uh, lift the degeneracy that would otherwise be present. Um, we know that small amount of impurities or off stoichiometry can give rise to also interesting effects. Uh, magnetic field can drive phase transition and uh, dimensional reduction in the uh, correlations that these systems display. Uh, pressure and uniaxial strain uh, have been studied and give rise to also interesting phenomena. So this is a third thread. Um, 
Now, um, looking uh, still within uh, hard connect smarter system, if we think about, for example, strongly correlated electronic systems or uh, uh, frustrated spin systems for which we don't really have a, a full blown theory yet, um, one kind of mindset that has been very uh, prominent in, in that field in studying these two systems is the notion of uh, gauge theories. Uh, where, for example, in strongly correlated electron systems, you have uh, what's called slave particle formalism, where you break your electron in as many parts as you can, uh, as pleases you, and uh, re you reconstruct those electrons in terms of a, a dynamical gauge uh, that fluctuates and and give, can give rise to a spin charge uh, separation, or is a mechanism to understand the notion of spin charge uh, separation. In highly frustrated magnetic systems, uh, also, um, uh, at low temperature when the magnetic moments are strongly correlated, but yet not ordered. Um, the description in terms of uh, a gauge theory is actually more um, uh, useful than simply the standard ginsburg landau theory that treats uh, pretty much uh, independent local order parameters. So this is a fourth thread in the field uh, that uh, I would like you to, to kind of think about. So, um, so if you put all this together, uh, and this is the most important slide of the talk. Um, uh, if you're going to remember one thing in this talk, I'd like you to remember um, this one, is that, um, so putting all the previous comments together, um, the question is, if we think about uh, uh, highly frustrated magnetic systems, uh, might we expect that if we consider them um, in a thin film geometry or restricted, uh, restricted geometries, uh, or near the surface of a single crystal, for example, might there be some interesting effects that happen just below the surface of such systems? And of course, expanding the question would be, how do we go about uh, exploring that kind of, uh, that, uh, such phenomena uh, below the surface? So I, I, I would call that like buried physics or something like that. And uh, so this is one kind of general question to, uh, that I'd like to, uh, to, to talk about. And the other one, uh, going back to the, um, um, the, this notion of gauge theory, uh, we know that uh, electromagnetism is uh, abundant with the discussion of uh, um, uh, boundary conditions and how this affects uh, um, the solution for the uh, uh, electromagnetic field, uh, depending on the boundary conditions and uh, physical phenomena results from that, like uh, total internal reflection and so on. So. Uh, so in, in thinking about uh, strongly correlated systems that are described by gauge theories, uh, what's, what happens with the boundaries on those emerging gauge theories? How do we treat them? Uh, do they, is there any, any interesting physics that uh, arise from uh, these boundary conditions? So, so in this talk, I want to argue that uh, highly frustrated magnetic power clause, um, which is a class, a, a subfamily of frustrated magnetic systems, in particular, the spin eye system is a good springboard to start asking these questions, um, both theoretically and interestingly, uh, also experimentally. And because of the success that uh, we have uh, witnessed over the last 20 years in understanding bulk spin eyes, uh, maybe again here we can proceed to uh, make a connection between the experimental efforts and uh, the theoretical one and m moving each, each of them uh, in, in unison. So, uh, so this is a developing research area. There's uh, some work is being done. It's not, uh, it's not a bandwagon yet. Uh, maybe it will, it will never be, but uh, I, I think the, the, the science, uh, the physics going on here is quite interesting. And this is what I want to talk about. Okay, so let me acknowledge uh, my collaborators uh, that I've worked on two projects that I will explain and uh, talk about in this talk. Uh, the first project, labeled one, um, was done in collaboration with a previous PhD student of mine, Taran Lin, and an undergrad student, uh, Tuba Opel, who's now doing a, a master at Columbia University in uh, economics. Uh, Ludovic Jobert is a CNIS in Bordeaux, and Peter Oldsworth, my longtime collaborator at the Ecole Normale Sphere in Lyon. And in project two, uh, a, previous, uh, a previous undergraduate student from the University of Montreal that some of you might uh, recognize, Etienne Lantang Urtubis who uh, was an outstanding student, did this PhD at uh, UBC with Marcel France, and is now a more uh, postdoctoral fellow at Caltech, and uh, a, a previous postdoc of mine, Jeff Rao, who's now a faculty at the University of Windsor. Okay, so the outline of the talk is as follows. So first, I, I'll go through a lightning speed review of spin eyes. Uh, this is uh, 
the old story, but just to, to get you to speed, for those of you who might not be uh, aware of some of the important details needed to talk about spin ice films, then I'll talk about uh, some of the early spin ice uh, thin film experiments that motivated the, uh, some of the work we did, and then talk about the, these two projects, uh, one and two, uh, some Monte Carlo simulations on semi-realistic models of spin ices and the large end theory that we developed to, to tackle some of these questions, and then uh, conclude. Okay, so, um, so spin ices are insulating magnetic materials. They are oxide compounds. Uh, the chemical formula is uh, R2M2O7. The R is a trivalent rare earth ion in the 4F lanthanide series, uh, this one here in the bottom of the periodic table. And uh, the M ion is a tetravalent transition metal ion. And in this start, we'll assume that uh, the tetravalent ion M is uh, just uh, dead meat, uh, carries no magnetic moment, and we'll just forget about it uh, uh, forever. OK, so, um, um, so if we focus on the, um, on the, um, the rare earth ion, the purple ion, and uh, the R occupy, occupying the R site. Um, so this, uh, the, um, in these systems, the uh, rare earth ions uh, sit on a lattice of corner, sh t t uh, corner sharing tetrahedra, which is uh, a portion of it is illustrated here. And um, um, what's important, uh, an important aspect of the physics of these materials is the fact that around each rare earth, rare earth ion, there is a distorted cube of oxygen um, with two different uh, sites uh, occupied by these oxygens. Uh, one of the oxygen uh, uh, mark in red here, dark red, occupies the geometrical center of each tetrahedron. And uh, uh, there are six oxygen, oxygens that form a puckered hexagon that is perpendicular to the, this direction, which are marked by the six um, a beige oxygen here. So um, the oxygen environment around each rare earth looks like uh, uh, a cube of oxygen that is being distorted while keeping the volume of these oxygens, uh, the, the volume of, of that cube uh, constant. And so just to give you a, a kind of an idea how, how strong this distortion is in terms of land scale, the distance from the rare earth the, at the center here to the red oxygen is about 2.2 angstrom, while the equatorial distance from the rare earth ion to the one of the beige oxygen is about 2.5 angstrom. So this distortion from an oxygen perspective is quite large. And so that means that this axis that goes through uh, the rare earth ion from one tetrahedron to the adjacent tetrahedron is, uh, is special. And in this talk, I will call this, um, this axis the z-axis. Uh, so uh, what's interesting is that uh, this is not a Brave lattice. Um, the, uh, the primitive unit cell consists of a tetrahedron. So for example, this tetrahedron here. And so around each of these uh, rare earths, there is such a cube. And so each of the rare earths ion, each of these purple sites here on this picture uh, have their own local z-axis. So it's not a global z-axis. It's a local z-axis, and uh, each of these z-axis is, um, is equal to or is parallel to the one, 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 the major diagonal of the cube. These materials are cubic, and the conventional unit cell is cubic, and so, uh, so these, uh, these directions, these z-axis are along this one, one, one direction. Okay, so uh, since this direction is privileged, uh, in general, we'll, we'll have two options. Either the magnetic moment likes to point along this axis, making it some kind of Ising system, uh, or the magnetic moment likes to point perpendicular or rotate perpendicular to this axis. Uh, in this case, we would call it an, an XY model. And uh, there might be a case where the ion uh, doesn't care. And we might want to call this a Heisenberg model in that case. So I, I'm making and trivializing a bit here, but this is kind of a, it helps to organize our thinking about these systems. And so, um, so here, this picture here illustrates uh, these axes, axes for uh, a single tetrahedron. The blue disk shows these uh, local XY planes, and which is encoding uh, here with uh, the corresponding ions that would have such a property with, that would be XY-like. Um, and uh, the Ising systems, uh, holmium, dysprosium, and terbium here would be Ising-like, and we know that this is not speculation, it's been established experimentally, 
and they're understood as well theoretically, uh, these uh, materials are Ising-like, meaning that the magnetic moment uh, prefers to um, uh, prefers to point along these um, these uh, these Ising one 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 direction. And so most of the talk, in fact, all of my talk, I will focus strictly on uh, holmium and dysprosium, in which case the Ising nature of these ions is for all practical purposes infinite. Uh, what that means is that uh, these systems, the magnetic moment or the, the pseudo spin describing the, the, um, the, the crystal field levels or the spin configuration of the ions is perfectly Ising-like. There's no quantum mechanics in these systems. Uh, there's no transverse fluctuations of the Ising spins. Each magnetic moment at each of these sites can either point parallel to the red, the one, one, one direction, the local one, one, one direction, or anti-parallel to it. That's it. There's no other option. Okay, so um, um, so let's talk about uh, the the spin isers which are uh, occurring in both the dysprosium and holmium compounds, where uh, when the B side either titanium, tin, or germanium is non-magnetic again, so. It, in, in really, in the literature, six, uh, six compounds have been extensively studied and displayed this, in the spin ice physics, again, in the bulk, and with the information that uh, I, I, I will uh, deliver here about the, the bulk properties of the systems, we can go and study uh, and start to think about thin films. Okay, so, um, um, so what happens in these uh, spin ice systems is the uh, effective interactions uh, uh, between the magnetic moments or the spins um, tends to, for, to for enforce that the uh, magnetic moments are ferromagnetically coupled. So this is kind of an interesting case where you have a frustrated ferromagnet. And so, um, so if you consider a single tetrahedron where the magnetic moments, uh, these Ising spins are forced to point along the local 111 direction, but the interaction between the spins is ferromagnetic, uh, the best you can do on a, on a single tetrahedron is to have two spins that point out and two spins that point in. So, um, so you, have, um, um, you have a tetrahedron that has four sites. Uh, at each site, you can have a spin in or out. Uh, so on a single tetrahedron, you have therefore two to the power four uh, states, and that's, uh, that's 16 states. So out of the, those 16 states, six of them uh, are two in, two out states. And so um, someone can uh, calculate or estimate the number of uh, ground states that they would be in such a system. So if, um, if the tetrahedron were independent, um, you would have, uh, uh, so, sorry, if you had the system of n spins, you would have n over four uh, tetrahedra. And so there would be six to the power n over four states that obey this uh, two in, two out states. But uh, this, um, this is an overestimate of the number of such two in, two out states because it neglects the, um, the, the connectivity of the lattice. So, um, so if you want to also impose that the nearest neighbor tetrahedra of uh, the original ones also must obey the two in, two out states, then uh, by chance there would be six out of those 16 states that uh, um, can satisfy the uh, two in, two out states. And so this is an estimate. This is a one term in an infinite series of estimating the number of states. Um, for the experts, this can be calculated using a method called uh, 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 link cluster expansion. Um, so this calculation uh, gives you an estimate that is accurate about, to about 5% uh, to the number of states in the system. And so uh, it's exponential in the number of, uh, of sites, n. And so therefore, if you take the log of this, uh, it gives you an extensive entropy at zero temperature. So, uh, and this is the number you get here for the entropy per spin in, in these systems. But it's an interesting uh, kind of situation where you have an extensive entropy uh, for a, a highly frustrated ferromagnet. Okay, so this entropy is uh, to be recognized with something that's been known for over 80 years. It's the same entropy that Linus Pauling calculated for water ice. And I don't want to have the time to make the connection here, but suffice to say that uh, the spin configuration in uh, spin ice uh, is a mapping or represent, uh, uh, a representation of the proton position uh, that accommodates hydrogen bonding in uh, uh, hydrogen bonded uh, water 
in the hexagonal or common uh, water ice. And so, so ice is also an interesting system. The, the, proton, uh, the proton violates the third law and there's a residual entropy called the Pauling entropy. And so spin ice is, uh, it's called this white spin ice and nothing, not something else, is because it has the same residual entropy as water ice. Okay, so how do we know that that's a fact? Uh, well, this was established in the NICE experiments already uh, 20 years ago by Art Ramirez and collaborator, where they measured uh, as a function of temperature, the uh, magnetic specific heat in these systems. And this is what the curve looks like at low temperature, uh, the magnetic specific heat or more precisely uh, C divided by T here. Uh, as you cool down the system, the, the specific heat uh, uh, rises. There's a maximum, there's no sharp peak, there's no phase transition, and then uh, the specific heat drops rapidly uh, below that peak uh, down to low temperature where essentially in these early experiments, there's no leftover specific heat. Um, so um, this, this experiment has been reproduced, repeated uh, dozens of times by several groups and uh, um, to, to a large extent uh, that the, this picture survives. Uh, apart from some details that I'm not going to, to get into in this talk. So what do we do with this? Uh, well, there's a thermodynamic relationship that uh, relates the specific heat to the entropy, which is C is equal to T dS dt. So it means that if you have access to C, uh, you can calculate uh, the entropy by integrating C over T between two temperatures, T1 and T2. So this is exactly what those guys did. Um, so we know that at infinite temperature, when T uh, let's say uh, T2 is uh, infinite or very large, um, the, the spins are uh, decorrelated. Um, you have uh, two possible degrees of freedom at each side. Uh, these are Ising spins up and down or in and or in or out. And so uh, the entropy per spin at infinite temperature is uh, log two. And so the entropy at infinite temperature starts at log two. That gives you your constant of integration in this equation. You measure the specific heat you throw the specific heat in this integral and you integrate downwards. And this is what is observed expansively as you cool down, um, the entropy gets removed and uh, you bottom out at the residual entropy, which is within expansively 10, 15% of this uh, the dashed blue line here. And that corresponds to the Pauling entropy. So this was the first experiment that did that. I like, I like to give credit to this work, but uh, these experiments have been refined and the agreement is much better than that in the uh, in, in experiments. Uh, the residual entropy is close to 5% of Pauling's entropy. In a conventional system, you would not get that. You would, uh, the system would find its ground state uh, at, at low temperature in accord with the third law of thermodynamics and there would be no residual ground state entropy. Okay, so how do we understand the physics of what's going on in these systems? Well, dysprosium and holmium have uh, a very large uh, uh, magnetic moment uh, in these systems, about 10 bohm magneton, um, which uh, gives them an energy a dipole, uh, dipole, dipole interaction, energy scale of order uh, D, here the prefact and the dipole interaction of, uh, of order of one Kelvin. And you, you should compare that with the Q-Vice temperature of these systems which is uh, also about one Kelvin. So the dipole interaction is a big part of the story in spin ices. And um, for a good measure, uh, you should expect there should be, there, there, there could be or should be um, a, a nearest neighbor uh, exchange interaction of super exchange origin um, that, uh, written, that is also Ising-like and that we, we write in this form here. And so, uh, so we know a priori uh, what is the magnetic moment on these ions. So therefore we know the dipolar coupling constant D. So J is a fitting parameter that we fit with experiments. And once it's fitted, uh, one single parameter to fit the theory, then we can proceed and do calculation. So, um, so through a number of uh, numerical studies, this is the picture that emerges out of this dipolar spin ice uh, model as it is now called, there's three regimes of temperature. Um, there's a high temperature regime, which is a temperature which is roughly larger than one Kelvin, for example, for dysprosium titanate. This is a high temperature regime. That's a completely trivial paramagnetic regime. It's a spin gas in, in, a, in a sense, if you want to talk about spin ice um, uh, as, a, a, as a particle system, the, uh, the high temperature regime is, a, is completely decorrelated 
And so what happens, uh, the, the physical interpretation of this maximum in the specific heat is when the, the system begins to enter into these uh, two in, two out uh, constraints that I, that I explained. And so when that happens, entropy gets removed and the specific heat, uh, the specific heat drops here. Uh, so the, the intermediate temperature regime here uh, between maybe 0.2 Kelvin and 1 Kelvin should, that is referred to as this spin ice state, you should really understand this uh, or view this state as a, as a spin liquid. It's a, it's a strongly correlated state of matter, but it's a classical spin liquid. There's no quantum mechanics in the system. And so this is a, why these spin ice have attracted so much attention because they are a springboard to try to understand strongly correlated of states of, of matter that don't have long range order, but yet are, are not trivial power magnet. And uh, at low temperature, um, what is predicted theoretically in, in this work here um, is a, a transition to long range order where this, this liquid state would uh, order, would crystallize where the magnetic moments are no longer strict, only obeying the two in two out rules, but a specific set of these configurations get selected uh, energetically. And um, when this happens to a phase transition, a first order phase transition to a long range ordered state. And um, so there's been many experiments that have looked for this uh, transition. Uh, it's never been seen because uh, the dynamics in this liquid state, um, we, we call it a spin liquid, but it's more like, uh, um, it's more like uh, maple syrup in uh, the Northwest territories. It's extremely uh, sluggish and the dynamics is very slow and it's believed that somehow uh, the system is not able to find, to equilibrate, to find the, the long range ordered state upon cooling. Okay, so, um, so what we find expertly doing the same thing as I explained, not expertly, numerically, explaining, doing uh, this uh, uh, calculation of the entropy by integrating the specific heat. You start at log two uh, with entropy, the entropy drops when you hit the peak in the specific heat, there's kind of a, 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 a slight plateau in the entropy at about the polling value marked by the horizontal blue line here. But uh, the, uh, in the simulations, the entropy keeps dropping until you hit the phase transition and then the entropy uh, drops uh, through uh, and releases a, a latent heat. And then at zero temperature in the model, there should be no residual entropy at, uh, at very low temperature. Okay, um, so this is the microscopic uh, of the of what is going on. Uh, Michel, yes. So there's a question about uh, subtracting the phonons again for oh. the specific heat. Well, uh, so uh, obviously in the in the model there's no uh, there's no phonon in the experiment. Um, in fact, uh, in this early experiment here. Um, they, uh, they really did not even bother, if I remember uh, correctly, with the, the phonons because um, the, um, uh, the, the by temperature in the system is quite large. Uh, these are ionic crystals of the order of a few hundred Kelvin. And so if you remember, the phonon should be like something like T cube. At one Kelvin, you have no phonons left. And, and so the, if you look at the raw data of the specific heat in, uh, in these materials, um, this uh, without any subtraction, this magnetic specific heat is, is clearly manifest. And so, um, so over the, uh, from five Kelvin or so down to uh, low temperature, you can ignore the phonons. Um, you have to be careful in adjusting your constant of integration um, because above five Kelvin, the phonon starts to start to contribute. So in more recent, in, in later work, in fact, that I took part with, with Peter Schiffer and collaborators, um, uh, you, you have to consider uh, the non-magnetic version of these compounds, for example, lutetium titanate, which is a non-magnetic uh, version. And then you do the standard thing. You remove the phonons by uh, estimating the, the by temperature and correcting for the mass and so on and so on. So below five Kelvin, you can ignore the phonon. Above five, five Kelvin, you have to be, do some work. Another question is, uh, uh, is this the ground state of the real ice? Um... Well, real ice, uh, ice has, uh, uh, there's 14 phases of ice depending on pressure and hexagonal ice, common ice has uh, two states as you cool it down. 
um, and you equilibrate uh, ice 11, I think, and another one that I forget. Um, and so to answer the question, um, in terms of mapping of the proton configuration in common ice and the, the spin configuration in this dipolar spin ice, I don't know the answer if it would correspond. And but, the, the phase transitions you were talking about at the end with the large peak is due to dipolar forces or? Yes, this, this is a simulate. This is, these are the results of the Monte Carlo simulations of the Monte Carlo simulations of this model here. So, so if you did not have the dipolar interaction, if you only had the, um, uh, the, the first term, there would be no transition. You would have, uh, you would have a, a residual entropy. So the physics, uh, the physics of the transition to a long range order uh, originates from, from the dipolar interactions. Okay, thank you. But in fact, it's, uh, to, to, to add to this, um, it's actually uh, perhaps more interesting than that in fact, in fact, empirically, um, by fitting experiments, we know that the first term is uh, actually the J is uh, negative, which means that uh, uh, in this uh, notation here, if there was no dipole, if there was no dipole, the, the Ising spins with the negative J here would order, would have a transition to long range order into not a two in, to out state, but in the all in, all out, which means on the reference tetrahedron, the, the, the spins would be pointing in, and on the four neighboring tetrahedra, they would be pointing out, or the converse. So there would be an Ising transition, a second order, second order Ising transition. So in fact, the answer to the question is twofold. The spin ice physics in these materials comes in fact from the dipoles. Uh, if there were no dipoles, they would be uh, in the system, uh, and you took the J that the materials have, there would be a transition. So the spin ice physics is driven by the dipoles, but also the dipoles solve themselves at sufficiently low temperature and, uh, and finds a long range ordered phase. Thank you. Okay, so, um, uh, so now if you remember, I talked about uh, gauge theories. So where does the gauge theory come from in the system? Right now, I've talked about experiments in the ball. Uh, microscopic theory in the ball. What about gauge descriptions and quasi particles and so on? So uh, this this is known from work that goes back to the 1980s on vertex models in two dimensions. But uh, these uh, highly fussed systems um, uh, for which the parent lattice is bipartite, uh, meaning here that the particle lattice is uh, can be viewed as having a, a dual lattice where the center of each uh, uh, tetrahedron forms a, a diamond lattice. And the diamond lattice is a bipartite lattice. And uh, the description of these fin configuration, given that this lat the dual lattice is bipartite, admits a divergence-free uh, condition. What does it mean? It means that uh, the, um, if you sit in the center of a tetrahedron and uh, you look at the field lines or the magnetization uh, vector locally in, inside each tetrahedron, uh, the ice rules means that you have two, um, two spins pointing in, which, which brings the magnetization in, and two spins point moving out, uh, pointing out, which uh, leads to the field lines, uh, the, ma the magnetization field lines, uh, magnetization field um, uh, pointing out. So the magnetization is divergence free uh, in the center of each trident. So the ice rules from a coarse grain pers uh, perspective obey a divergence free condition, which I've written here in this equation here, divergence of M equals zero. And so, um, so the, the spin I state from the point of view of the M field in, in, this, uh, in this slide here is uh, uh, corresponds to a soup of uh, lines of the, uh, of lines of spins that, uh, uh, that do not, uh, um, that, not, that are uninterrupted, that permeates the whole system. And so, um, so, um, so as long as the system is perfectly into the, uh, in the two in, two out I rules, the uh, divergence of the local magnetization is zero um, uh, on all sides of the diamond lattice, right? So, the, um, um, uh, so when a spin flips uh, due to, let's say, thermal fluctuations, then the divergence condition is violated 
and uh, one can assign this uh, validation of the divergence of the magnetization as a sink or a source of the magnetization field. And so I want to obtain uh, an, an equivalent of a magnetic Gauss law, which is the divergence of M is proportional to the, in the again, from a coarse grain perspective, is proportional to the density of these defects. And so, um, so again, fo focusing the discussion uh, uh, not on the spins on the corners of the tetrahedra, but focusing on what happens from at the center of the tetrahedra. Now, uh, uh, when on a tetrahedron, the, uh, the spins are flipped uh, and there's a violation of this divergence free condition, there's a charge uh, uh, in this, in a, there's a magnetic charge that resides in the, uh, in the center of the tetrahedron. And uh, so these charges and this magnetic Gauss law is, re is, is already reminding of what we know about the Coulomb's law uh, in electrostatic. Okay, so this is beautiful work that was done by uh, Claudia Castelnovo, Roderick Mostner, and Sandy, published in Nature already 14 years ago, which has uh, in excess of, uh, thousands, of thousands of citations by now. Okay, so this is interesting. Uh, so we can, uh, we can focus uh, on this magnetization field M that, that is a coarse-grained version of the spin field, and we can focus on the, the excitation of the systems, which are the spins that are flipped, which are the sinks and sources, and so here, for example, is a configuration of tetrahedra that will be the two in, two out state. If um, the spin here at the bottom is flipped, this uh, tetrahedron here now has a configuration of three spins pointing in and one spin pointing out. So this is a, uh, let's say, a sink of uh, the magnetization or a source. And uh, by the tetrahedron here uh, that is below the spin here where the uh, um, the, the spin has flipped would, would have the compensating charge. And so these, uh, these uh, chargers, these magnetic chargers can hop diffuse in the lattice because there's, uh, these are Ising systems. There's no dynamics in, the, in these models. So everything is diffusive. Uh, these, uh, these chargers can find themselves at some finite distance with each other. And if you focus now on the effective interaction between these uh, chargers that are mediated by the background of these ice uh, of the tetrahedra that still fulfill the <coughs> sorry, sorry I apologize that still fulfill the ice rules uh, these charges experience uh, an effective interaction which is uh, in fact uh, coulombic it uh, it's one of the R and so so the, these uh, these charges which uh, have become known as uh, monopoles and they are not Maxwell's or Dirac's monopoles as in the uh, vacuum QED they are uh, they are sinks and sources of the magnetization M uh, have a charge QM, which can be estimated or calculated on the basis of what's the magnetic moment of the parent spins um, and the lattice spacing. So QM is known, and instead of having one over four pi epsilon zero as the Coulomb constant in front of the potential, you have mu naught over four pi. And these uh, these charges uh, interact with uh, one of the R potential. So this is the, uh, this is the background for why these systems are interesting. You have a microscopic understanding, you have experiments, and you have uh, uh, an, emerging, uh, um, an emerging field theory, which is here simple. It's, it, there's no quantum mechanics. Uh, it's an emerging uh, uh, electrostatic field theory. And this connects with the, uh, the beginning of my talk where I was saying, why would these systems be of interesting? So they give us a, 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 an, an approach, a, a way to, uh, to look at what happens when you, we take these materials now and not in the bulk, but we sandwich them uh, in, a, in a very thin film. So, so th th that physics actually is um, quite well established by now. Um, I don't have time to, to get into, into this in detail, but out of this, um, uh, uh, this description in terms of the gauge theory or the field theory, one can heuristically um, put forward a, um, uh, a model which characterizes the, the free energy of these systems, which is a, a Gaussian theory uh, here, uh, supplemented by the condition that the magnetization should be divergence free. And so, so one thing I will come back later in the talk is that uh, there's a parameter uh, that characterizes the, the scale, um, the scale of this uh, free energy, uh, this constant K, here, which has, uh, which has, let's say, units of energy. 
and then it's a very important parameter in, in in this in this model in this coarse grain model and um, so out of this model you uh, what you what can you do with this well you can actually deconvolve uh, deconvolve how the the coarse grain magnetization depends on the spins themselves and with that you can calculate the um, the spin structure factor which would be observed in neutron scattering for example and so what you observe in neutron scattering and what this theory predicts is the presence of pinch points. Um, so what are pinch points? There are, for example, in neutron scattering, this is an intensity map in reciprocal space of a neutron scattering experiment done, done many years ago by Tom Fennell. And what you see are these locations in reciprocal space where depending on how you approach these positions in uh, these various momentum location or wave vectors, uh, the intensity is, is either uh, monotonous and essentially constant along some directions, for example, here along the, the zero, zero L direction. But here, if you approach this location here uh, perpendicular along the H, H zero uh, direction, the intensity is essentially zero. And then at that point, at the so-called pinch points, the intensity jumps in a discontinuous manner to the value it has um, going along the zero, zero L direction. So the, the spin structure factor is extremely anisotropic um, uh, at uh, about these uh, these pinch points, and so the presence of these pinch points in the neutron experiment is in fact a reflect that the underlying theory obeys this divergence free condition. And the width of the pinch points uh, in in uh, reciprocal space are indicator of the typical density of uh, of these monopoles. So this is a theory that neglects the monopoles. It's a essentially no defect, but as you increase the temperature, those monopoles, the spins flip, the monopoles get created and they broaden the pinch point. So this is kind of an elegant theory where we seems apparently, seem to understand everything. Okay, so, uh, so spin ice have been beaten to death uh, for the past 20 years. Uh, many experiments, many, uh, many problems, many questions. And the, the one I want to uh, uh, trigger your interest uh, with is uh, what happens when you take these materials and you put them in a thin film con uh, in a thin film uh, situation. Okay, so uh, uh, what is known experimentally? So there were two experiments uh, published in the same in, at the same time in 2014, one on holmium titanate spin ice thin film and one on dysprosium uh, titanate sp uh, thin, uh, spin ice uh, with different substrate. Uh, um, so um, since then, there's been more work. It's slowly uh, um, taking uh, picking up speed uh, in terms of what uh, can be done, and uh, people are starting to diversify the exploration, not looking only at power cores, but looking at uh, perovskites, perovskites, uh, magnetic perovskites, and also uh, uh, spinels, and trying to explore. You know, really, is an exploration to discover, dis discover new physics in uh, in in thin film frustrated systems okay so what is found experimentally um, without going into the details uh, these are magnetization measurements in, in in thin films and these magnetization measurements so what you do is you measure the magnetization uh, in your of your thin film with different orientations of the applied magnetic field and because these systems are strongly ising like um, the saturation magnetization uh, in large field at low temperature depends on the field uh, direction. And so without going into the details of the, what these curves are and why they have the value they have, the important message is that in high field, the value in which the magnetization saturates is different for different field directions. And um, that value is compatible with the value you would expect uh, for uh, ising moments in, in such a system. So the message is that the ising nature of the magnetic moments in these thin films from five unit cells to 60 unit cells uh, is the same as in the ball. We're still dealing with ising spins. So that's good. Um, now, the more interesting result is this one. Uh, it's a thermodynamic measurement of dysprosium, dysprosium titanate thin films, which in the bulk, which is the experiment site of Ramirez that I mentioned earlier, um, um, shows spin ice phenomena. So here's the, um, what it looks like, and this is actually addresses the question about phonons. The blue curve is the full signal uh, from the thin films that includes uh, 
the substrate and the thin films. Uh, and you can see that the magnetic uh, con contribution is actually quite large at low temperature. So you have to do some work to remove the phonons above five Kelvin, but at low temperature, it's clear there's a magnetic signal. So in the bulk, uh, you get this result, uh, this result here marked by the black line, uh, which uh, has this residual entropy that I explained, but uh, the film alone um, are uh, collected here by the, these curves here, um, where the different colors uh, label the different thicknesses of films that were studied, uh, 5, 20, 40, and 60 in itself. So, uh, so what do you see in these results? Uh, first of all, in above, let's say, 3 Kelvin, all these curves uh, overlap with each other, uh, um, combined together, they overlap, which means that the, uh, in the high temperature limit, uh, the fact that the curves overlap means that the Hamiltonian of the system is pretty much the same. If the Hamiltonian that described or the model that described these systems, if the curves were drastically different above 2 Kelvin, it means that the, the model has been significantly uh, modified and we'd be a bit stuck to get even started modeling what's going on. Excuse uh, me, uh, Michel? Yes. There's a question by uh, Andrea Bianchi. I'm not sure I understand it, so perhaps, but Andrea, you can speak up. Yeah, so uh, so on the uh, neutron scattering, uh, the inelastic neutron scattering picture, the yeah. thing should be fourfold, have a fourfold symmetry, but there are two red spots on top and bottom. Do you know what, we're, what the reason for those is? Two red spots? Yeah, so in the inner, so in the most circle, there are two red spots. Oh, yes. Um so the, that's the, just a, that's just a, the, 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 the bad subtraction of the you're talking about the, the, the spot here at zero zero one yeah. so no yeah. that's real that's real uh, so depends uh, if depending on who you ask this question you might get a different answer uh, but you're asking me so um, the uh, we believe that this is a this is a precursor a signature of the um, of the long range order that this uh, system would have if it was to order. So uh, okay. the, the long range order would have uh, intensity at these locations. Okay, thank so, you. Uh, so actually we calculated with the small I showed the neutron scattering for uh, holmium titanate and uh, it essentially agrees perfectly uh, down to half a Kelvin. Okay. With, with, no, adjustable, with no, and no adjustable parameters except this constant J which we can determine from, let's say, specific heat. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. OK, so um, and the most obvious feature, never mind this uh, detail of what happens at high temperature, is the fact that all these uh, specific heat at low temperature uh, reach a maximum, which is way higher than what is seen in the bulk. So there's much more uh, uh, entropy being released in the films that they were in the bulk. And so you can already see where I'm going with this. Um, if you repeat this exercise of integrating C over T from high temperature down to low temperature, you're going to get different results for these uh, orange, green, red, and blue curves here than you get for the bulk. And this is this figure here. Uh, I'm not exactly happy the way this figure looks like. Um, I would have preferred if everything was shift shifted at high temperature at log two, but nonetheless, here they assume that the constant of integration at the lowest temperature was zero and integrated upward in temperature. Um, that's a matter of taste, perhaps. And so in the bulk, if you start here and you integrate the curve, you end up with uh, not at log two at high temperature, but at something which is offset, which means that the choice of zero here was a bad choice. You should have really shifted your curve at low temperature by this deficit, which is the Pauling entropy. OK, so this black curve here for the bulk is the same result as what I talked about earlier. But all these other results here, all the, the films, uh, all the films uh, show that uh, actually there's no residual entropy. There's no, uh, there's no degeneracy left at low temperature in these spin ice films. The, the, um, the fabrication of the, the spin ice films uh, do not have a Pauling residual entropy. And uh, the question is why and the, what's the physics that gives rise to that? And is there new physics, or interesting physics behind that? Okay, so uh, so just to, now I'm gonna get, uh, this was kind of an overview and a qualitative discussion of uh, these systems. Let me, uh, let me tell you what is our survey uh, in these two projects that we did, project one and two, um, 
of, of, of uh, what, what may, what may be going on. And so uh, this is uh, the first thing we did. We consider a model, the same Hamiltonian, the same uh, model that I described earlier, um, where uh, we have a slab, a spin ice slab, where we essentially cut the system uh, above and below um, the, the, the thickness of the film. So it's, it's a kind of an artificial model in a sense. We don't have a substrate. Uh, we, we have a, a free floating film of dipolar spin ice describing this boson titanate with, um, with no, uh, no, no effect, no chemical effects coming from a substrate. Um, but we take into account the boundary condition in a very minimal way. Um, and that minimal way has to do with the fact that if you look at these, uh, the top surface of this film here and the bottom surface, there are different tetrahedra. There are the tetrahedra which are still there that are inside the film, and there are those which have been cleaved away by the fact that there's no spin ice below and there's no spin ice material above the film. And so to, to make that a bit more, trans, more obvious, these are these what I call the cleaved away tetrahedra. Uh, the ones that are uh, highlighted in blue here. So those tetrahedra, uh, uh, they are not there in the materials. And the assumption is that, of course, all the oxygens that is above the, 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 the film, uh, all these oxygens are gone as well. But um, the oxygens that are still there in the film, below, uh, these, red, uh, below these red links here, uh, they still contribute to this uh, coupling J that I mentioned earlier that I said, was negative in the bulk. And so, um, so by symmetry, simply, we expect that these bonds here that we call orphan bonds um, um, will be different by symmetry than the, the bonds that, um, that are on the uh, upward tetrahedron. Of course, even these bonds here, J might be different, um, might want to call them J prime compared to those in the bulk, but then it becomes a, 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 a uh, a game of playing with models, which is not something we wanted to do. So this is a, a model where uh, uh, we can take the original model um, and uh, simply no renormalize the couplings at, at the free surface where these often bonds are. And we also look at the effect of strain, uh, modifying the Hamiltonian by uh, having a, a strain in, 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 the, in, in the model, changing the coupling as we as we go inside the bulk, but I don't want to talk about this. Uh, um, I, can I interrupt you again? There's a question from David. Is it possible that neglecting the dynamics or the kinetic energy, so to speak, is fine in the 3D bulk, but not in 2D films? And the dynamics could lift the ground state degeneracy? Well, um, you have, I guess by dynamics, you mean spin dynamics. Uh, so um, remember, right? Um, uh, that's a good question. Um, uh, the it's a very good question. It's a deep question because the fact that these systems are uh, icing like is is uh, is not obvious. In fact, I made it sound trivial, but it's far from obvious. It took over fifteen years to figure this out. Um, but uh, um, the it's possible that because of the fact that symmetry is lowered in in at the surface. And there's a strain that that modification of the symmetry propagates through the film, and the symmetry con constraint that gives rise to the icing condition is modified, and then one doesn't strictly have uh, icing pseudo spins anymore, but would have maybe some kind of a, a XXZ model or a, a quantum spin one half model where dynamics would have to be reconsidered. Um, so from that perspective, from the point of view of a lowering of symmetry. Uh, due to the boundary condition, it's possible that dynamics could play a role in the system, but that hasn't been looked at. Should I continue? Yeah, yeah, please. Thank you. Okay, so um, so um, so what do we find? Um, we find that uh, um, depending on the uh, uh, let me go here. So we find two conditions. The this often bonds can be. Uh, very strong and uh, very much anti fall magnetic, uh, meaning much more negative um, than in the in the bulk, or they can be not so much or even positive. And so there's two families of results. Um, if this often bound at the surface um, likes spin ice, uh, then uh, the the magnetic moments at the surface. Uh, let me go here. 
the magnetic moment would be obeying the uh, ice rules. So for example, this tetrahedron here would have its two in two out spin configuration. And this tetrahedron here that is connected by an orphan bound would also like to have the, uh, uh, its two in two out configuration, which it does here. But if the orphan bound is such that uh, it would correspond to the same sign of coupling as when the tetrahedron that was there what, before it got cleaved away by the presence of film, the, um, these two spins would be pointing out of this one and in this one. Um, so there's two options, right? Either the, the magnetization field M that I mentioned earlier, either it's smooth at the surface and it runs, the field lines run parallel to the surface and re-enter in the adjacent tetrahedra, or they don't, they oppose each other. And that's controlled by the sign of this often bond coupling. If the often bond coupling is uh, sufficiently large and negative, what you find is that these two spins uh, at the, uh, at connected by the often bonds, they actually want to be pointing in or out parallel to kind of as parallel to each other as, they, uh, as possible. And so that means that there is a, uh, there's a magnetic, there's a monopole crystal that crystallizes at high temperature before you enter the spin ice regime in these systems. And so um, how we got to understand that is a bit complicated than uh, for uh, in conservation of time, I'm not going to get into that, but um, if you're interested, please reach back to me and I, I'd be delighted to, to talk about this. So the story is the following. Um, uh, when, in the, when, the, when the couplings at the surface are sufficiently strong and negative, the surface freezes in terms of a magnetic order at the surfaces, but the inside the film stays uh, in the spin eye state. Um, and, and that we can, uh, we can uh, uh, demonstrate that, we understand it by looking at thermodynamics, by looking at entropy, uh, by looking at order parameters, density of defects, these are these different curves here. And so, um, so the first peak in the specific heat, for example, shows that the surface as ordered in, in, a, in a monopole crystal, uh, leaving the, uh, the inside of the film uh, disordered in a spin liquid. So this is an interesting phenomenon of uh, what I mentioned at the very beginning of my talk, which is uh, the phenomenon of surface freezing. Here we have a magnetic surface freezing um, the surface freezes, but the bulk is a, is a liquid. Uh, and then at low enough temperature, the bulk orders uh, through the interactions that give rise to the long range ordered phase that I mentioned too, that happens in the bulk. So um, we can characterize that by looking at spin structure factor or what a, a neutron a depth dependent or what a neutron, de a neutron experiments would see. And uh, it, it confirms the story I just said. Okay, so um, uh, that's interesting for the experts. Let me just say that uh, for one layer thick film, uh, the, uh, once the surface freezes, what it leaves inside the, 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 in the film, which is two la uh, one layer thick, is called the, uh, a it's a vertex model. It's called the F model. Um, and uh, there's some really interesting statistical mechanics associated to, to that. Okay, so this is nice. There's some interesting ph physics, uh, you know, near uh, surface freezing of monopole of emerging quasi particles, these monopoles, uh, or magnetic long range order, if you want to be more uh, 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 simpler. Um, but we really understand, we don't have any theory here. Any, there's, everything is numerical, not very satisfactory. So, so we wanted to try to begin addressing the question of boundary conditions and how we would construct a gauge theory with boundary conditions. And how, to, how do we proceed with that? So, so this uh, gauge theory that I mentioned, this uh, minimal Gaussian theory that I mentioned is actually anchored into something called large N theory, which is kind of a, an approximation uh, that allows to solve the partition function of these models when the interactions are um, nearest neighbor. Everything can be done essentially analytically in the bulk. And so, so we decided to, to use this large N theory, but now for, um, for spin ice films, but to simplify, um, considering only a uh, nearest neighbor, uh, nearest neighbor model. Uh, so we threw away the dipole interaction and we switched the sign of this coupling J, um, this coupling J that uh, the nearest neighbor coupling in order to, to engineer 
a, a model that has finite physics, a residual entropy. Okay, so, um, so it's the same model otherwise, uh, but now everything is nearest neighbor. So we still have a film. We have a coupling J everywhere, except on these orphan bonds. And then uh, we do the large N theory. So the large N theory is a, it's a really kind of a neat method. Um, it has, um, it's a, a theory that goes a bit beyond mean field theory. It allows to, to, um, to calculate the structure factor correlations and, um, and, and propagate these correlations. In the bulk, uh, the essence of this mean field theory, uh, this, this large N theory, is that there's a Lagrange multiplier that enters the formalism. And this Lagrange multiplier, which is denoted lambda here, is a, um, is, a, is a quantity that enforces that when you, you crank the calculation, the, you conserve the length of the spins uh, at each site. Uh, and uh, the length of that spin uh, is such that it has n components. This is why it's called large n. Uh, you let that number of components, n goes to infinity, and then that problem, that large n method, allows you to solve uh, the set of equations, the partition function, that system. And it's been known for uh, 50 years that this corresponds to the solution of what's called the spherical model. The magic here, which is not fully understood, is that actually for, in the bulk, uh, the large N theory works even for the Ising model uh, qualitatively. What that means is that the Ising model has one component, N equals to one. But uh, a lot of the qualitative physics of spin ice in the bulk uh, can be understood on the base of the large n model or the large n calculation when n is infinite. And so, um, so I'd be happy to, to discuss that if you're interested. So, so what we did here, we applied the large n method, but in a film. So now because uh, we break translational invariance, this Lagrange multiplier that enforces that the spin length is one, um, uh, has to be uh, resolved spatially as a function of location in the film, as a function of depth. And so wh why is that interesting? It turns out that uh, this, uh, this Lagrange multiplier in the large end theory is as a connection with this constant K that I mentioned in the field theory, they are proportional to each other in, in a sense. So uh, this microscopic calculation here is a, is op opens the door towards constructing ultimately a, a gauge theory for these systems and addressing the question of boundary conditions from a, a coarse grain formalism, but we're not there yet. Okay, so these are the results. Um, uh, so we solve for films which are uh, uh, three layers, five layers and 20 layers long, uh, la uh, thick, um, this Lagrange multiplier as a function of thickness. And so let me march you through the last, uh, the last picture, the last uh, panel here for simplicity, the top, um, the top um, um, curve shows what is this Lagrange multiplier at high temperature. Uh, and so at high temperature, well before the system develops these spin ice correlations. And so what you see is that essentially is, um, it's, um, it's independent of the layer label. So here, uh, L equals uh, 10 is the center of the film and L equals zero and L equals 19 are the two extremes of the film. So the middle of the film is here and these are the two uh, uh, outer surfaces of the film. And so as you decrease the temperature, the Lagrange multiplier drops. So here you're moving from here to here to here, uh, the temperature is being decreased. And then uh, we know that in the limit of very low temperature, the Lagrange multiplier in the bulk should approach the value one half. Uh, that's known and understood. And so you can see here that at the very low temperature, these, uh, these purple curves here uh, have reached the value lambda in the middle of the film, uh, which is uh, one half. So the middle of the film behaves as if it, it was in the bulk. But what's interesting is that you see some, some stuff going on through, through the, uh, the free surface. There's, there's some wiggles that develops through uh, the, uh, at low temperature. So once, once the system enters the spin ice um, regime, the low temperature regime, this Lagrange multiplier uh, starts to, to oscillate. So it's not, it's not Friedel oscillations because there's no electrons here, but it's a bit similar to uh, impurity. The surface acts as an impurity in, into these systems in generating these oscillations. And these oscillations are very short range. They live over two, three layers only. And um, so, um, 
and that's that's nice um Michelle, uh, yeah. I'm sorry, uh, you will have to conclude soon, right? Because yes, it... I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Okay, so um, um, so um, the um, so this Lagrangian multiplier may uh, may look uh, is a bit esoteric, and might you might ask, what does it mean? Uh, so what we did is we can also calculate um, the the spin spin correlation function, or equivalently, we could calculate the function of depth. What a depth resolved structure factor measurement would show. And so this is more physical. And uh, what we find is that uh, the, 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 the spin spin correlation function has also uh, uh, an amplitude that is modulated as a function of depth. And uh, so, um, and moreover, uh, the right results in this panel here, uh, for example, show the results from large n. And you see these uh, oscillations here uh, at the free surface. And on the left hand side, these are not the large end simulations, they are Monte Carlo simulations. And so you see that the qualitative physics and the periodicity of these modulations are reproduced between Monte Carlo and large end. And so, um, so we, we believe it's real. Um, what it means, uh, we don't understand. Let me skip that just to show that uh, we can calculate pictures which correspond to structure factor and uh, we understand some of this, but not completely. Um, we can, one could ask what would happen if we didn't have the film such that the film is grown in the crystallographic one zero zero direction and in different direction. And then we expect the physics actually to be, to be, to be different. And so that would also be interesting to explore. Uh, very little has been done. Okay, so um, let me conclude. Um, so, um, so from Mathilde's point of view, um, uh, these power close in films can be grown in exquisite quality, I'm told, uh, with a very accurate uh, control of the thickness from a couple of layers to the bulk. Um, uh, there's many materials to play that game with. I talked about the Ising case, but if you change the rare earth ions, if, we, if you remember what I mentioned about Ising and XY, um, there is a possibility to explore different physics so we have started to look at that for the erbium titanate problem. There's also some very interesting physics that goes on for the XY case, and obviously I'm out of time. And uh, uh, more generally speaking, uh, moving away from the power clause, I think this question of what happens when you have strongly correlated or highly frustrated magnetic system and you confine the geometry, I think there's some interesting physics uh, hiding behind this kind of question. And uh, I'm looking forward to, to see more uh, theoretical and experimental work in this area. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. So are there questions? Uh, Jan? Uh, yes, um, so I just have a basic question. So this uh, monopole excitations, can you create currents of them by with with some gradients of magnetic field or something? Yeah, yes, uh, good question. Uh, this has been attempted uh, uh, by uh, Seamus Davis in collaboration with Graham Luke at McMaster. And um, so what happens is that uh, these, um, um, uh, in, in the bulk, uh, those gradients would essentially, uh, with uh, fixed boundary conditions or even a finite crystal, they will happen uh, for some time, uh, but then uh, whenever you move monopoles, you essentially flip spins and you magnetize the system. And so once the system is gets magnetized, uh, then um, the dynamics, the, the diffusion of the monopole stops. And um, also uh, these monopoles, there's a tendency mostly from just about everybody to think about those monopoles as chargers moving in, vacu in vacuum. But there is an ether here, right? There are spins and the, the microscope, the, the spins are there. So whenever a monopole flies by, it flips the spins. And so there's a memory in the system. And so they are not uh, uh, retractable. Once the monopole has gone by, it cannot come back uh, easily because they, the spins have, are encoding a new configuration. So there's a, uh, uh, in the, spin, the monopoles that come behind, uh, they cannot follow the same track. So there's some kind of memory that actually quenches this uh, uh, th this kind of physics that you're talking about. But uh, there's more work that can be done for sure to try to 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 be more clever to try to 
to do that. I've, it's been done most in, in, in the context of what's called artificial spin ice, but uh, I'm not able to make a more intelligent comments than what I just did. Okay. So maybe uh, just a more general question. So you talk mainly about equilibrium properties, but do people study also like non-equilibrium properties of these systems and can they have signatures that are also special or? Right, so people have looked at, uh, for example, in the magnetic field, people have looked at uh, something like uh, uh, oh, uh, kibble zurek kind of phenomena uh, for the, the phase transition uh, in terms of non-equilibrium, in terms of magnetic field. Uh, that's also being explored, again, in the context of two-dimensional lithographically made artificial spin ice. Um, um, so... Um, and uh, the question of avalanches, for example, people have looked at that. Um, this is not an area that I've, I, I've, uh, I've followed, but I could point you to some uh, reviews, uh, recent reviews that, uh, that, that speak to, to this topic. Okay, okay. Thank you very much for a nice talk. Thank you, thank you. So I do not see any more questions. So thank you very much, Michel, for this very, very nice. Uh, well, thank you. Th thank you. Sorry, I ran a bit over time, but uh, I, I wanted to, I think once you understand the physics in the bulk and you can believe that there might be some interesting physics in some film. And then if you're interested, you can, uh, can look for it yourself in the, in the literature or contact me. I'll be happy to discuss it. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.